What's up everybody, hope all is well. Activision Blizzard, fresh off lawsuits and fines related to employee exploitation now find themselves embroiled in controversy surrounding player exploitation via their new game, Diablo Immortal. It's a battle of capitalism, profit margins, scream the executives, it's a battle of entertainment, gameplay and art, scream the players, it's a battle of ethics, that's illegal and you can't sell it, scream the courts. Ultimately, with so many parties involved and so much at stake, monetization mechanics are a battle for the soul of the gaming industry. There was a time Blizzard was the industry darling. They could do no wrong. One genre defined a game after the other, Blizzard was the gold standard, synonymous with exceptional games made for gamers by gamers. From 1994 to 2004, they gave us Warcraft, Diablo, Starcraft, and World of Warcraft, four IPs that are, even today, 30 years later, revered by players and leveraged for new content and revenue streams. Blizzard was, rightfully so, celebrated. I lived through it, and it was, in fact, a beautiful time to be a gamer. But something happened in 2006, which at first appeared to be just a ripple in the water, but turned out to be a tsunami gamers are just now, two decades later, starting to see the true destructive force of. Bethesda would be the first major publisher to add a microtransaction to their game, and Elder Scrolls IV, for $2.50, you could buy horse armor. Players balked, but despite the outrage, it went on to sell well in the industry and world took notice. The next few years would see others take up the same model, but it was employed primarily to serve as an additional revenue stream, not the primary one, an important distinction. Later in the decade, however, the advent of smartphones kicked everything up a notch, specifically Apple, whose app store invented the infamous free-to-play model. You see, mobile gaming was new and unregulated and hidden behind fanciful walled gardens, so few took notice at just how predatory and bad it was, but Apple received a slice of every transaction racking up billions. The first two years of the App Store generated roughly $4 billion in revenue, 75% of that coming from mobile game microtransactions. That's that's nuts. When one of the biggest tech companies in the world creates a whole new industry and mobile gaming microtransactions are the primary driver, you bet your ass every gaming executive in the world took notice. And with that, the genie was out of the bottle. It would take just a few short years for the free-to-play and pay-to-win models to come to PC and console. It's become an escalating war with developers and publishers pushing the envelope a little harder, a little further to see just how much they can get away with. How much of the game can they sacrifice in the name of profits? A slippery slope indeed. It's my opinion that this period, say from 2010 to 2015, was the inflection point for the industry, as eagle-eyed capitalists started to recognize game industry revenue put every other form of entertainment to shame, they leveraged their soft power to force a slow but strategic shift away from the art and towards business. And this came with more nefarious intentions. While the advent of gaming was purely about entertainment, the second phase would be focused on using existing IPs as exploitation devices. Which brings us to today's modus operandi for some of the industry. Create a problem and sell the solution. Now, to be clear, we're talking pay to win mechanics here. I think most are fine with cosmetics, even if begrudgingly, but paying money for an in-game advantage is the line. Not just because it cheapens the experience and ruins competitive integrity, but because it opens the door to developers and publishers abusing it. It's a big deal because it's evident there's a slow creeping trend of game design being based on exploitation. Just look at Diablo Immortal. I consider the people who made this those who knowingly designed the systems to be about as bad as any call scammer. They're knowingly and per purposefully employing deceitful tactics solely to manipulate, trick, obfuscate and exploit people out of money. It's a big deal because if this trend continues, it's only a matter of time until these game destroying monetization models are in virtually every game on every platform. You simply won't be able to play a game to its fullest potential without paying additional hundreds, thousands, even hundreds of thousands of dollars. And if you think that last one's an exaggeration, it's not, as we'll discuss shortly. It's a big deal because what is arguably the best vehicle for artistic expression, video games is being hindered by profits, storytelling, music, art, acting, and more go into creating these interactive and often profound experiences. The pure artistry would be irrelevant. Pay to win, in particular, cheapens the experience. It's a big deal because it's predatory. A lot of people being exploited are kids or gambling addicts or individuals who aren't mentally equipped to understand what's really going on here. It gives the entire industry a bad rap. It's a big deal because exploitive mechanics employed in Diablo Immortal already have the game outlawed in Belgium and Denmark. And earlier this week, the European Consumer Union, consisting of 18 countries, called for regulation. Granted, this is a good thing finally being on government's radar, but we've seen some politicians demonize gaming in general, so again, slippery slope. Dramatic? I know. Overly dramatic? 
Not in the least. Whether you use games as an escape, a way to bond with friends, or just appreciate the artistic and technical accomplishments, it's all at risk. And even if you think you'll just play casual and take the experience as far as you can without making additional purchases, think again. These barriers to entry and experience will continue to encroach earlier and earlier in the game. They'll grow more egregious. They'll reach a point where games aren't really games anymore. Instead, they'll be tools designed to keep you on the hamster wheel as long as possible, paying as much as possible for as little as possible in return. And there's a crucial element to all this, whales. Players who are willing to spend tens of thousands, even hundreds of thousands of dollars on a game. I think in some cases, developers knowingly hyper-monetize the game, understanding it'll alienate 99% of the players, while also understanding all they need is a few hundred whales to keep them afloat. The rub is, pay-to-win games are relentlessly mocked by gamers, thus putting off some whales from playing in general. If no one else is playing, no point in spending a few grand to look cool in game, am I right? So let's talk about how the industry in general employs various psychological tactics to exploit players. I'm not well versed in this area, so I won't be going deep, but in my research, a few key themes kept popping up. Number one, obfuscation. Developers create layer upon layer of virtual currencies, reward tiers, and probabilities to ensure the true cost and value of a purchaser action is unknown to the player. Number two, deceptive design. The first hit's free. Developers design games so the beginning is enjoyable and microtransactions, if any at all at this point, are either free or cheap and offer legit benefits. You'll often see them advertised as, you know, plus 800% value or some random figure. These are always BS, but as the game progresses, the need to purchase help weighs more heavily on players, eventually reaching a point where it's essentially required to progress and things get more expensive as you level up. Number three, sunk cost fallacy and endowed progress. Two terms that hit at the same thing. If you've put work in towards something, you're more likely to continue. This also applies to money. If you put money into the game already, you're more likely to continue and to even greater degrees. Number four, dynamic probabilities and the gambler's fallacy. Developers use algorithms to adjust probability of rewards on the fly. And with so many layers of obfuscation, there's almost no way to know what your odds really are. Number five, grinding. By making some of the game laborious and extremely time consuming, players are incentivized to skip these sections and progress by purchasing help. And finally, FOMO and Envy, the fear of missing out. If you want to keep up with your friends in game or get that special time limited skin or be able to compete in content, you're going to need to pay more. And developers go to great lengths to instill envies in the have not, such as matchmaking players with bad gear with those with awesome gear. In theory, these are interesting concepts. In practice, however, not so much. If you're a gamer and take time to consider it, I bet you've experienced each one of these to one degree or another, maybe even in games you love or games you never even considered. In all in all honesty, I think some of it is just inherent to video games, to life really, unescapable, and some, to a degree, in certain situations, actually central to gaming worlds. Who didn't love the grind a while back in the day, or seeing that max level warrior in full raid gear you envied? So it cuts both ways, I guess. Regardless, I think we all agree the differences in being pay to win versus play to earn. So now let's talk Diablo Immortal specifically. Let's put things in perspective. There are varying estimates as to how much it'll cost to fully gear out a character in Diablo Immortal, but most agree it's in the six figure range. And there are varying estimates as to how much you'd have to play to max out a character without using pay to win mechanics. Most agree anywhere from several months to a few years a few years. While we wait for someone to actually do it and confirm, all we can say for now is that these figures are even possible is insane. Even if it's a fraction of that, it's insane. I struggled to find words to describe such a bold level of greed and inappropriateness. And it's important to understand, people aren't upset purely because of the price tag, it's that Blizzard designed the game in such a way as to essentially necessitate you participate in the pay to win systems. We'll get into it a bit more shortly, but the mechanics of it all are so wild, I sincerely think think the term pay to win doesn't do it justice. Pay to progress is more apt. Now, my knowledge here comes from my experience playing and a few videos by Bellular Gaming. If you don't know him, he owns a game studio and runs a few YouTube channels. By virtue of these, he's somewhat of a connected insider and has very intelligent and reasonable takes. Highly recommended, links below. To understand the pay to win mechanics in Diablo Immortal, you need to know about one thing, gems. 
Player power is driven primarily by these. It's what the game's based around. Gems have several empowerment tracks. They need to be leveled up to, I think, rank 10, I believe, at which point you can awaken them to unlock additional attributes and then increase the awakened attributes even more by stacking additional gems onto it. I think this is called resonance. It won't surprise you to know the item needed to make all this happen. Legendary crests are essentially only available in the cash shop. Put player power behind an item and put that item behind a paywall. That, in a nutshell, is the business model of Diablo Immortal. And there's nuance to drive the obfuscation. Like crests, which you need to obtain gems, come in two varieties. Rare can be obtained just by playing, but they only have a chance to unlock a gem, and at best, it'll be level 2 quality. If you want a guaranteed gem with a possible quality of level 5, you're going to have to pay. So let's get into the cash shop. Notice how it's the first square in the menu? Just saying. There are two currencies, Eternal Orbs and Platinum. You need 160 Eternal Orbs to purchase one Legendary Crest, but notice how they sell staggered increments of them so it doesn't quite line up. You have to buy more than you need. Cosmetics can be as much as $1,500, so about $25 worth of orbs. As for services, there's the Free Battle Pass, an Empowered Battle Pass for 5 bucks, and a Collector's Empowered Battle Pass for 15 bucks. There's also something called a Boona Plenty for $9, which gives you daily login rewards. They also sell mats for about $2 for one unit. So basically, unless you're willing to spend money and a lot of it, you're locked out from ever having the best gear. No amount of playing or quality of play can get you what money can buy. There are conversion and upgrade mechanics at play behind all this, but they're just added layers of obfuscation and additional avenues to get players paying. And to add insult to injury, additional tabs in the cash shop open up as you progress. A new service called Prodigy's Path is basically paying another 15 bucks to unlock additional materials and items as you level up. I could keep going but i'm afraid you already tuned out after all that it's just so convoluted and honestly annoying to even think about but you can see how blizzard's working it they made an unbearable grind incentivizing players to pay to win and then obfuscating those systems behind various out of sync currencies and services and reward requirements and to make sure some players bite they included gems in pvp So final thoughts, it is a mobile port, meaning these pay to win mechanics sort of come with the turf, but I'm calling it out for what it is. It's a test run for Blizzard and the whole industry's watching to see if they get away with it. Diablo Immortal is the perfect vehicle for it, a mobile port with the expectation of pay to win mechanics masked as a gift to the players who were never even supposed to get it on PC to begin with. I can just see some executive doing the whole shoulder shrugging, what, what, we gave you Diablo Immortal, you're welcome. It's likely we never see anything even approaching this level in their real PC games, but you know what? I guarantee we see aspects of it. You can bet Blizzard's data services are hard at work mining data on player behavior to see exactly what systems and mechanisms drive specific purchasing behaviors they want in the next game. So for me, it's just unfortunate in the final nail in the coffin of Blizzard's rep. Actually, second to last, we'll see how Overwatch 2 ends up. I feel bad saying it and I'm sincerely not trying to be a jerk, but if we look, all they've done in the last 10 years is Overwatch in 2020. 2016. And that game is struggling. Fast forward six years and we get an egregious pay to win mobile port, huh? Uh, combine that with all the lawsuit stuff they've got going on and yeah, I can't really find a reason to root for the brand anymore. Not a hater, just you know, it is what it is. If you're going to play Diablo Immortal, you have two choices. Play casually until you hit the progression paywall, probably 15-ish hours, or pay to win and pay big. But let's end on a high note. I have faith that a good game gets its due. The community makes sure of it. Pay to win makes a lot of noise, but on PC it's rare thus far. Instead, quietly, there's an army of talented developers of studios who are faithful to the artistic endeavor and believe in the power of games as a force for good. They just want to tell us an amazing story or provide incredible gameplay or wow us with cutting edge technical achievements or bring people together from all cultures and do it all at a fair price. And to those developers, I'd say, yes, please take my money. And with that, I'm done. Appreciate you taking the time. Take care of one another and I will see you soon.